Welcome. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce the third of our four Murdoch Mixology speakers, Judith Schechter. Um, and, and if you don't, I hope all of you know me by now, but I'm Ann Craville. I'm the director and CEO here at the Wichita Art Museum. I've been here for just over a year, so celebrating my anniversary. And thank you. Um, it's, it's been a whirlwind, and it has been so exciting, and I'm so happy to have you all along for the adventure. Um, I had the pleasure of learning about Judith's work back in 2006 when I worked at the Vero Beach Museum of Art, and they had an exhibition, Studio Glass, Then and Now. And so then fast forward almost two decades later, and I find myself here at the helm of Wham, and I learn about this endowment that we have, this trust, the F. Price Kaufman Trust to support glass acquisitions. And I said to Tara, you know, we really should look at this woman, Judith, like she just does this amazing stuff. And yeah, yeah. So, you know, we put her on the list and, and um, at, back in October, we go to New York and we were looking at um, Vanessa German's work, which we got with the glass trust too, because of all the coke heads. And, um, and then we went out to um, a studio or a, a gallery, um, Claire Oliver Gallery in Harlem. And so that's where we also discovered Robert Peterson. And we're talking with Claire Oliver and she said, I want to show you the exhibition upstairs that I'm doing. And guess whose work it was? Judith. <laughs> so it was like this October visit in New York led to so many amazing things, including three incredible acquisitions that we're so happy to have um, here in our, our museum. So just a little overview on Judith. She's lived and worked in Philadelphia since graduating in 1983 with a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design Glass program. She has received the Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships and Craft, the Louis Comfort Tiffany Award, the Joan Mitchell Award, two Pennsylvania Council of the Arts Awards, the Pew Fellowship in the Arts, and a Leeway Foundation grant. Her work is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Victorian Albert Museum in London, the Hermitage in Russia, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Corning Museum of Glass, the Renwick Gallery, the Smithsonian, and the Wichita Art Museum, to name a few. Um, in addition to her practice, she is also a teacher, and she has led numerous workshops at many venues that you're familiar with, I'm sure, like the Pilchuck School of Glass, Penland School of Craft, Toyama Institute of Glass, the Australia National University in um, Canberra, Australia, and she's taught many courses at the Rhode Island School of Design, the Pennsylvania Academy, and the New York Academy of Art, and the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, which is my alma mater. Um, she is ranked, uh, where she's ranked as an adjunct professor. Her work was included in the 2002 Whitney Biennial, a collateral exhibition of the Venice Biennale in 2012, and she is a 2008 USA Artist Rockefeller Fellow. And in 2013, Judith was inducted to the American Craft Council College of Fellows. So that's just a little bit. So please give me a, a hand and a warm welcome to Judith. <laughs> I never recognize myself <laughs> in that when I hear my resume, um, I'm always nervous at first, so don't mind if I'm like warbly. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me to speak, and thank you for your support of the Wichita Art Museum. So important to have people support the arts in this country. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so I'm just going to uh, ramble on about my favorite subject, which is me. Um, I am from Philadelphia, that is the Rocky statue. My parents are alumni of Kansas University, both of them. I've never been to Wichita though. Um, uh, my family heritage is important, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. My mother, who is, uh, um, my mother is up there on the left, and that is my mother's family. She's from Oklahoma. She's from Bartlesville. And my, she met my dad, who is from, uh, basically, he's Russian Jewish. He's from Milan, Italy, and Quito, Ecuador. And for reasons I find mostly unfathomable, he went to the University of Kansas <laughs> and <laughs> met my mother. So I am a half-and-half -half person. And uh, I think that is one reason why 
I've always been very comfortable in sort of half and half situations. Like I consider myself to be an artist and a craftsperson. I don't feel like I have to choose one or the other and I'm very proud of being both. These are my actual grandmothers. The, <laughs> um, the one who's saying, you go girl. That's my, my uh, grandma Thompson from Bortlesville. She was very instrumental in me becoming an artist. She herself was an artist, or she was a housewife, but she made a lot of art projects. And I really, and uh, the one that says, do it for the team. My family got land in uh, um, Oklahoma during the, the uh, land run. And uh, they, did, they were always dirt poor, so that land is now worthless today. But... <laughs> Anyway, um, so I've always um, felt, I'm not, I sort of imagine myself to be a spiritual person in some way or another, but uh, I don't, it doesn't take any particular form. But I have always imagined that my grandmothers are rooting for me and that they are delighted that I have managed to become an artist because I am sure that they would have really enjoyed doing something that they were passionate about. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't all just farming. But <laughs> you never know. Um, just a few facts. Here is a list of things that channel one into the arts. And that's me on the right. Um, I, I was always a misfit. And uh, I was a misfit for a lot of reasons. Um, although I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, uh, I grew up in a Catholic area, and it was always sort of a weird thing that I was an atheist and half Jewish and half Christian. Like, this was just unfathomable to some people for some reason. Um, my brother was, is, was uh, normal but got encephalitis as a child, and he has basically a brain injury. If you met him, you, um, you would maybe notice it. Um, I definitely have ADHD, which I'm sure you'll notice during the lecture. And I'm bad at sports, and I was teased at school for being ugly. And that is really important to me because I think it really informs the look of my art, which um, sometimes when I refer to, like, I'm trying to make my art beautiful. Sometimes that makes people laugh, but I, <laughs> my idea of beautiful. I also wasn't a great student. Um, I learned to be uh, a solitary person, which is very, very helpful for the arts. I'm left-handed, and I uh, loved drawing. Yes! Yes! Yeah, this was cool. Yay, lefties! I love drawing and making things. My parents were very supportive, and I just want to acknowledge that my parents were very supportive financially. For many years, I couldn't even bear to bring that up because I was so embarrassed. Most people I knew had to work for a living. I, I, I wanted to work for a living, but my parents were willing to float me when I was a young artist, and that made a big difference in being able to survive during the early years. So thanks, Mom and Dad. That was an amazing gift. Uh, my parents also took me to museums a lot. And I'm from the middle class. All right, enough about me. How do you think I look? Um, so now I'm going to talk about my artwork. And uh, one of the most uh, common questions I get is, you know, how do you come up with ideas and develop them into actual pieces? And this is not how it happens. Um, one thing that inspires me is the material of glass. So I'm often working with the glass to come up with new technical ideas. And this piece is very glass specific because it has these pictures of glass vessels in them. I am gonna talk to you about technique, but here's a little preview. The glass itself is engraved. So each row here, the top, there's a blue layer and a red layer and you put them together and you get this full color. So on the red layer, I have yellow which is, the yellow is silver stain. It actually stains the glass when you put it in a kiln. And black paint, that's it. And you get all those colors out of those combinations. I know, it's amazing. 
I also had this weird fetish for making this as hard as possible. Um, <laughs> you know, I had, I, I had a retrospective during COVID, which is not something I would recommend, but uh, I, it did happen and it is on my resume, and I think like a few people saw it. But uh, uh, it started at the Rochester Memorial Art Gallery, and they had these quotes of mine on the wall, and there was nothing more bizarre than to walk into a room with like quotes by me on the wall. And one of them was that I consider stained glass to be an extreme sport. And uh, I like that quote, that's the only one I like. But uh, anyway, so you can see the bottom picture is reflected light. And I have made all those rocks and flowers out of separate tiny pieces of glass. The whole piece is maybe 30 inches wide and 20 inches tall at the most. Um, I could, there are many ways to skin a cat. I, there are a thousand ways to make an image in stained glass. I deliberately chose a way that would be the biggest pain in the neck humanly possible. And I think, it's hard, it, for many years I just kind of did it and, and I couldn't articulate why. But um, I think at this point I understand that I'm trying to make a case for like, if I'm willing to sacrifice all of this time and energy into, into creating this image, that it's worth looking at. You know, I didn't just like whip it out the easy way. I did it the hardest way possible so that you would understand that it's important. <clears throat> okay. There we go. All right, there's the little cereal bowls full of stuff. Also, you see uh, the top image is different than the final image. Okay. I also have a large collection of um, imagery that I find inspiring. Um, this is from my folder of uh, men crawling on all fours. The top left is a Lucas Cranach. I remember my cousins from Oklahoma think I'm insane. And uh, I, I posted that picture on Facebook to prove that I did not invent the idea of being a weirdo myself. <laughs> there are other weird people. Another aspect of working in glass is that I really enjoy improvising with the glass. I know it doesn't look like they're improvised at all because there's something about seeing a, a completed work of art that you, it's hard to imagine the creative process. But this entire section was really done very spontaneously and as I went. So it was basically improvised. That's the drawing I was working from. So these are the three layers separated. Often I work in layers of glass, and to create that image, it's a piece of red glass, a piece of blue glass, and a piece of pink glass on top of each other, kind of like a color separation for printing. But I'm not planning it ahead of time. I'm just doing stuff and seeing what happens. It's not that impressive. It would be impressive if I could conceptualize it ahead of time. Sometimes uh, they're not fused together, they're just held together in, uh, with the copper foil when I assemble it. They're not compatible, the glass is incompatible. A second way I get inspired is by drawing, and uh, it, it just blew my mind to realize that the, um, the word to draw also means to pull or drag, because while I always wanted to be a visionary artist, I don't actually have visions, unfortunately. I don't see these things ahead of time and draw them. I am pulling them out of my head and I see them when they're on the page, but not before that. So I doodle a lot and I find doodling very inspiring. In fact, I like to doodle during faculty meetings. That is the most inspiring time to doodle. <laughs> I, I compile the doodles I take them off of those pages and put them onto pages like that in Photoshop so that they're usable. And this, these doodles here became this piece here. I also like to steal ideas. I think that's sort of self-explanatory. I will say King of Maggots was the per first piece I did after I graduated from RISD. 
Um, I was not going to continue in glass because I didn't understand at all how I was going to be able to set up a glass shop in my house. But it became uh, more obvious to me when I missed it so much I thought I was going to die. This is uh, on the right is a piece from a church in England that I just blatantly ripped off. <laughs> and sometimes I steal things without knowing it. Um, this piece is apparently an image of Danae, who I never even heard of until an art historian friend of mine said, oh, it's Danae. And I'm like, who's Danae? Well, Danae is this person. And there's a close-up. Um, <laughs> I, I had made this um, head, and I was so in love with the head, I really felt it was the best uh, glass image that I had ever made. And it just sat in a Tupperware box for about six years before I made a body for it that I liked, and then I couldn't figure out what to do with the rest of the piece. And uh, it, it, it took forever. I, I would go visit my dad in California and swim laps in the pool where he lives and try to think of an idea to how to finish this one. Anyway, I finally finished it. Um, this is a very famous painting, a very famous painting that I really love. <clears throat> I did this drawing during COVID. And it was my uh, version. I did not want to reference it too closely because I think the, the uh, Jericho painting is perfect and I didn't want to make myself look bad by doing a cheap ass imitation. So, uh, so I did some, uh, something a little different. There's a pencil drawing and I then had it in my mind that it wouldn't be worth anything if I couldn't make it into an endless repeating pattern, which is what this is. So, uh, you know, Definitely something you might want to uh, wallpaper your powder room in. <laughs> this piece, and it eventually became a glass piece. Part of this was inspired by the um, political uh, uh, action during COVID for Black Lives Matter, which really, um, first of all, I was too much of a coward to go out and protest with people, which bothered me a lot. Um, but I was I, very afraid of COVID. And, uh, but I felt like there were people that were so passionate that they were basically risking their lives and that this was important. And that's part of the inspiration for the piece, not the whole inspiration. The idea of the raft of the Medusa for me, and this is a repeating image, by the way, is that we're all kind of stuck in this world together and that it's hard to try to get along. There are forces greater than us keeping us from getting along, maybe our own biology. I don't know who here has read Robert Sapolsky's book, Behave, anyone? Oh, I feel so lonely. You all have to read it. <laughs> there will be a test next week. Um, it's about uh, you know, what makes human beings so great and what makes them so awful. It's a really excellent read for, for lay people. Anyway, uh, there, a lot of people read this as a just endless conflict, but there's a, a lot of moments of tenderness in here too. Not that. That's the, <laughs> but it is my favorite part, the very dysfunctional couple. Um, sometimes I get ideas from weird sort of mashups, like um, here's uh, the, uh, you know what a meme is not just an internet image. A meme, uh, the term was coined way before the internet, and it, it means a unit of cultural transmission. So the image of a, a guy on a desert island with a palm tree is a meme. Um, I always wanted to do a piece based on that meme, and one day I just happened to come across this image, and I just I felt like I was on fire with inspiration. <laughs> it was it's such a like. You know, and I wasn't interested in the mushroom or the snake, really, just the bottom part. And I was like, I, I get it. I, <laughs> and I made this piece based on that. I want you to memorize this piece because a little bit later it's going to come back up, but I don't have another image of it. Here's some details. 
All right. So here is a famous Trump Loy painting by some Dutch person whose name I forget. And here is Charles Wilson Peel, the artist in his museum, and then a political cartoon from 1573 or 1599 called The Papist Pyramid. So all three of these images combined in my head and became this image. This one was nuts. I think the drawings for this took almost a half a year. Uh, I was taking these old botanical or you know natural history images of snakes and I was unwinding them in Photoshop so that I could wind them back together again so that they would um, work together and make an endless repeating pattern also because nothing is worth doing anymore unless it repeats endlessly. Here are the two plates separate like the blue and the red, and the red has black enamel fired onto it and silver stain, which also fires on and makes the yellow. The bottom has a little bit of pink. The pink is uh, actually oil paint. It doesn't fire on. It is only permanent if you install it in a light box. If you put that in the sun, the pink would go away. That's a detail. I know, it's truly crazy. <laughs> and, uh, all right. Now I'm going to talk to you specifically about technique. That's an actual photograph of me soldering a window that I uh, uh, put into the famous uh, uh, Odalisk painting by, was it Titian? Is that also a Titian? This is way too much Titian in one lecture. I don't even like Titian. <laughs> All right. So here's a piece from 2016 called The Life Ecstatic, and I'm going to show you how I did the, uh, the red Google map pin. Well, first I'm going to show you that. So here it is in progress. That's an earlier stage on the left and a little bit later on the right. I'm working with a type of glass which is called flash glass. Flash glass is handmade glass and you're not allowed to go, like sometimes people say, do you blow your own glass? And I say no and they go, oh. That's <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, it already takes me months and months and months to make these things. I'm a terrible glass blower. I have blown glass. I'm not good at it. And uh, I don't really want to be good at it. So let's just not worry about me blowing glass, okay? Anyway, <laughs> so the glass is characterized by having a very thin veneer of very bright color on it. It was actually invented during the Middle Ages because if this glass was solid red or solid blue, it would be so dark it would just appear to be black. However, uh, people have been removing the layer of color since medieval times, but now we have power tools so it's a little easier. So I, uh, I'm not going to show you specifically how I do it, but I use a combination of sandblasting and then um, flexible shaft engravers, other types of engravers that are a lot like dentist drills, and uh, um, also hand filing, which is something I invented myself. And I'm never going to stop saying that because now I'm at a point where I realize people just sometimes take credit for this stuff. So I invented that and no one else did. Um, <laughs> so here it is a little further along. So the figure, for example, is done with a lot of engraving with a file. And that's hand engraving. It's really exhausting on your body. It is physically taxing. And I don't understand why I don't look like Popeye. <laughs> All right, here's another example. I'm going to be talking about that colorful band of birds at the top. That's what the pieces look like separate. There is a very uh, common to my work is to work with red glass first, which often has the black paint and the silver stain on it, and then a blue layer and a pink layer. And when you put all of those things together, you get all of those colors. But again, I don't plan ahead. When I teach this, the students are all like, oh my god, I have to like know what it's going to look like ahead of time. Well, your head will explode, so don't do it. <laughs> and you might think that for something like this head that I have planned it ahead, but I have not planned it ahead. But what I have done is put most of the information on one piece of glass. And I work that for a long time before I move on to the other layers. So I'm really doing a lot of work on the red 
before introducing the blue. I'll see if I can go back. I'm scared to, of this clacker now. I have, I have trauma. All right, this is short because it actually took about an hour, but it's three minutes now. So this is the flexible shaft engraving tool, and I'm working the flash glass, and that is the diamond file that is not plugged in. It's probably about as thin, it, first of all, they're all different, okay. and it just depends on how much beer they had for breakfast at the factory. Uh, <laughs> um, you can kind of tell by how bright the color is, but that is not always a good indicator. It just, it really depends. Um, this red is fairly thin, but it doesn't engrave as nice as the blue, and the, the blue's a little thicker. When you work with glass for a long time, you start to think things like, oh God, the red's like mushy. <laughs> Red glass is mushy glass, and the blue glass, it's more brittle and weird. I love, love, love doing this stuff. This is probably why I'm not out stealing cars and causing mayhem. Uh, <laughs> this keeps me a, an honest citizen. I also do uh, something that sort of vaguely passes for traditional glass painting. It's not exactly the same. Um, this piece, if you happen to be in Philadelphia in the next few months, is on view at PAFA, Pennsylvania Academy at the Pine Arts. You don't know what PAFA is to me. Pennsylvania Academy. Um, this uh, type of style is uh, very common to the sort of Renaissance and post-Renaissance period after the Protestants uh, smashed all the stained glass and they, they weren't making colored glass anymore. So they had to make stained glass windows out of paint and clear glass. That's a close-up. You may be wondering, why did you just do this picture? Well, you'll have to ask. That's it being painted in... It, you, the way you paint with glass is you you do it in layers and you have to fire it in between. So the first top left is just a, a gray tone and line work. You fire it, then you put some more paint on it and maybe you put some highlights in with an engraving tool and you go back and forth with paint, highlights, paint, highlights, fire, and uh, eventually you get something that's worth looking at. And here's some of the details. These are called quarries or quarrels, actually. So next time you see those little diamonds in a church window, you know the word for them, quarries. Um, just a note about uh, my creative process. Uh, I don't know if perfectionism is the right term because I don't believe that perfection is possible, but I will tell you I'm really fussed. Here's a piece, the lower right-hand side is the finished piece, but I literally made the piece four times before I could sleep at night, and uh, that was a big pain in the butt. Uh, fortunately, the Corning Museum bought it, so it was all worth it. <laughs> and some more uh, pieces of recent work. This is beached whale, which is in Iowa, right? Is it in Iowa? I think it's in Iowa. Uh, and then the whaling museum in New Bedford wanted to buy it. And I was like, well, it's in Iowa, a landlocked state. But <laughs> <laughs> they said, will you make another piece about a whale? And it was like, I would love to be in the whaling museum. That's such a great idea, but I only have one tragic whale piece in me. <laughs> Some of those piece, pieces were inspired by climate change, which to me is the most critical uh, issue of our times or future times anyway. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw the original Blade Runner, but one of the themes, yeah, I see some hands going up, excellent. Um, one of the themes of the, that movie is that basically nature has been eradicated, but they have managed to make facsimiles of nature that are indistinguishable from from uh, real, and uh, I thought I would start designing the flowers for the future. Here they are. 
Um, so if anyone wants to start synthesizing them in a lab, that would be excellent. I have more designs. And this was about basically uh, keeping our water supply clean, which strikes me as important. But my pieces are always open to interpretation. Oh, except this one. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. I started, this, I, I think this is hard to be articulate about. I wanted to make a piece that connected chopping down rainforests with the idea of toxic masculinity, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to bash men because I love men. I, d I feel like we're all sort of, uh, victims of our own society and our upbringing and people are like we're in a runaway train to some extent anyway um, this design repeats endlessly and maybe someday this will also be um, uh, a nice fabric design um, <laughs> and I would wear it it was also my my original idea was to make a, a lumberjack Cutting down a tree. I will just say that on my mother's side, the reason my family is from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, is because my grandfather worked for Phillips 66. And the reason my grandfather worked for Phillips 66 is that his family was originally from Pennsylvania, which I did not know when I moved to Pennsylvania, is that my, I have deep Pennsylvania roots. And they got land after the revolution and basically started chopping down trees. And they chopped down all the trees in Pennsylvania, progressively going west, chop, 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 chop. And this was basically the equivalent of being in the energy business. And then they get to Western PA and they've chopped down the last tree in Pennsylvania and they struck oil in what is called Oil City, Pennsylvania, where they're doing all the shale stuff now. And um, so uh, I love lumberjacks. I'm not... Uh, you know, this is my heritage to some extent, or at least half of my heritage is tree chopping. Uh, here's a close up. Oh, that went fast. There we go. That was, yeah, this piece was super fun to me. And I was, uh, like I said, I was only going to do one lumberjack, but I ended up drawing seven of them, so I used them all. <laughs> Uh, recently, I've become much more interested in what used to be the backgrounds of my piece. This is a piece called Flight Patterns. And Flight Pattern, I don't know if it's the next slide. There. You can buy Judith Schechter pajamas <laughs> at anthropology.com. I, when I saw this photograph, I, like, this gorgeous model wearing this pattern and she looks very happy and I thought I've never experienced my work like this before yes this, was, this is amazing um I, I'm thrilled with this they also make a bathrobe with a different pattern on <laughs> this was another piece I made um during COVID I used to ride a bicycle everywhere, but um, first of all, my, one of my retinas went wonky and I couldn't see distance very well, so I thought I should stop riding a bike before I killed myself. And um, when I, I started walking, it was like I had to learn how to walk because <laughs> my uh, muscles in my uh, pelvis were so tight that I, like, I was like, anyway, I can walk now. <laughs> and. and uh, on my walks, what I noticed is, is that human beings often walk around carrying a little bag of dog do. And, <laughs> and I, thought, I thought this was ex really profound, and I wanted to make a piece about it. So I also felt like making a cityscape. There she is. Before I design a piece, I often spend a lot of time coming up with a million different alternatives for a resolution, and I mean sometimes a million. Um, I had, and often I've made the character already in glass, and it's sitting in a Tupperware box underneath my table, waiting to be used for something. 
So I was trying many different um, ideas of what to do with this woman in the puffy coat. I mean, I, th we, I mean, puffy coats are funny, right? And I own a puffy coat, but it was a real concession because um, I just couldn't stand being cold anymore. <laughs> so I bought a puffy coat. But why can't they make a puffy coat like that? All right, um, here's a piece from uh, a recent piece called Passengers. Passengers, like it's so unromantic sometimes how art comes about. I, I needed a, a project where I didn't have to have a global perspective because I was teaching at three different schools at once and I knew that I would be in the studio um, like on and off very sporadically and with my ADHD, it can be very hard to focus. So I needed something where I was only focusing on like this lozenge and not even the whole lozenge, just half the lozenge. So basically I made 50 ovals with women holding a flower, 50 of them. And then I started mixing and matching them in all different kinds of crazy ways. I had no idea what they were gonna look like. It was vaguely inspired by the face cards in a deck of cards. And here's some details of this piece. Oh, more. Jeez, I really like this word. And this is the most recent piece. I just have a couple more things to show you that I'm going to talk uh, uh, in detail about here I come. This is the most uh, recent stained glass window that I've completed. Well, second to the most recent. It's called Swarm. Uh, I'm an artist in residence at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Neuroaesthetics. And this isn't really a residency. Like, I just go once a week to their lab meeting, and I'm supposed to make art about the experience. And um, um, I was trying to sort of conceptualize creativity as an emergent phenomenon. But I also wanted to um, see how many different flies I could come up with. Like, as a... a I have this ax to grind about um, creativity and imagination. Like, if I could do it all over again as a teacher, I would be just much more um, uh, insistent on teaching about the imagination, which I don't feel like we do very much of in art school, which seems criminal to me. And uh, this, I am building this dome in my studio, which I am filling with images. I will show you close-ups of them. And this has to do with the fact that at the Penn Center for Neuroaesthetics, they study biophilic space, which is a very fancy science word for basically rooms that are full of nature motifs and natural materials. And uh, it's inspired by biophilic ideas. It's not actually being very true to them. I also thought just to stick it to science, uh, I mean, I love science, but Part of me wants to make like a little church <laughs> um, uh, because I think part of what art does is, is spiritual. And I can't explain that in words that are effective, especially since I have an atheist background. But uh, despite all that atheism, I've, I've come around to believe in something. And uh, this is my church to that. And since no church is hiring me, I had to build my own. Here's some close-ups. I have an assistant for this project. I haven't had an assistant in ages. This thing has a mind of its own. And this is a drawing I'm gonna do someday. I don't always do fancy drawings like this, but I, I just did nothing but draw with pencils during COVID. All right, here I come. Yay! First of all, I just uh, thank you for, for your support, Wichita Museum of Art. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces that I've done recently, and I'm so, so glad that it's placed in a prominent public collection. That means a lot to me. Um, and here's a little bit about how it came about. First of all, I don't know exactly why I wanted to do a drawing of a woman running. I remember, I, you know, Inspiration is a weird thing to quantify in words, and a lot of it happens uh, pre-consciously and very, very, very quickly. 
So uh, this is sort of a, what I'm showing you here, uh, is going to be like an idea map of all of the sort of weird stuff that was going on in my head that informed this piece. Um, there is an ad, uh, a meme of women running from houses, which you are all familiar with. And I wanted to do, as a response, a woman running towards something rather than running away from something. Thank you. Oh, there you go. You can visit womenrunningfromhouses.blogspot.com for more information. <laughs> There's also lots of images of women athletes that look exactly like this photograph. They're on, like, bus shelters and stuff. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was listening to this song. I listened to Pandora Radio because I can't make a, like, I can't think for myself. Just play me music you think I'll like, thank you. And it was constantly playing me this song, which I really liked, and uh, then I looked up the video on YouTube, and here it had this like women's sports imagery, which I found fascinating. But meanwhile, also, I was listening to this song, which, first of all, the song um, deeply references William Butler Yeats' poem, The Second Coming, which is an amazing poem. It's the one that ends something slouching towards uh, Bethlehem. Um, and the, the center won't hold and stuff like that. It's, it's an amazing poem to reread now. So y'all go home and there will be a test on everything that I've mentioned later. Um, I, so I know you're not gonna like look these up, but I just thought I'd show you. So I, did, I had the idea of doing a running woman and I did a zillion sketches and then I put them in Photoshop and I you know cut their legs off and move them around and do things to try to find something I actually like it at this point in my life I'm the hardest person to please of all which is why I hate being criticized <laughs> <laughs> this, this work is pre-criticized for your enjoyment so this is the final drawing. And like I said, I do not usually do or, and don't need to do a fancy drawing, but I enjoy doing them sometimes. I d deeply related to this character. I don't, these are not self-portraits, but if I don't feel an affinity for the character, I can't possibly bring anything to fruition. So I'm deeply identified t for her. And um, apropos of that song, Fight For You, the reason that was important besides the sports imagery was that the theme of the song is this woman is fighting for her man. And the way I interpreted it, it turned out to be totally wrong, but I felt like it wasn't like she was like fighting a rival to win his affection so much as she was, well, maybe this tells you way too much personal about me, but that she was maybe involved in a man with, with low self-esteem and she was fighting for him to to feel better about himself and maybe that's a recurring pattern in my life I don't know maybe anyway so so I really wanted her to like what appealed to me was she she can't run and <laughs> she seems to still have her baby teeth and uh, um, she's all sweaty, you know? Uh, that is all stuff I can relate to. Like, I'm coming to your emotional rescue. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm really trying. Uh, <laughs> so that became the theme of the piece for me. Um, and also menopause, which I will get into in a minute. There is nothing like menopause to inspire me. I went into uh, Night Cafe, which is an AI generator, and said, girl running climate change menopause because I wanted to see if, if it would come up with something, anything like my piece, and I think it kind of did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm fascinated by AI. I, uh, if you're, I have a blog, and I, I, I interviewed ChatGPT on my blog, and at the end of the interview, I made it, I made it kiss my butt. And, <laughs> And it did it, and it was really fun. <laughs> and if I ever teach the seminar where I make them write an artist statement, I'm gonna make them put it through chat GPT. So once I had the running girl, my problems were not over because I had no idea what to do with her. You can't make a picture without there being something around her, right? And this is a smattering of some of the 
resolutions I looked into, uh, and you can see the, the, the one there that is it. <laughs> that one next to it with the honking big line going through it is because it was actually very hard technically to create that piece because of the size of those red chunks. So I was trying to get out of that. Here's some more, because there was more. Like maybe she should be chasing butterflies. So in creativity, there, according to psychologists, there's two kinds of thinking. There's divergent thinking, where you think of a zillion ideas, and there's convergent thinking, where you focus and refine them. And supposedly, you need both skills to be effective as a creative person. And I will say the, the take home fact for me is that it is impossible to do convergent and divergent thinking at the same time. It's like driving with your foot on the brake and the gas. It doesn't work well in a car to do that. And uh, I've gotten much better at my divergent thinking without criticizing it. So I'll try any stupid idea. Yep. And that's the piece again. And that is the whole lecture. So thank you very much. Do you want questions? Yes. A couple of questions. Yes. Do you get humor rewards for your lectures? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think it would be fun to do like a funny podcast about art. Um, no, but I would accept one if you wanted to give it to me. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, some of them are great-grandmothers and great-great-grandmothers. And uh, there was one there that is, I think, four or five greats. She was from northwestern Pennsylvania. Almira Tuller was her name. And she clearly has no teeth. <laughs> I'm a direct descendant from her. And I'm losing all my teeth, too. Um, yes, back there. Well, first of all, to me, they are gorgeous. I have never done a, a face that wasn't outstandingly beautiful to me. And one of the reasons I wanted to be a uh, resident with the Penn Center for Neuroaesthetics is that they study the idea of beauty to scientifically, which interests me. Um, but, I, you know, I, I was once part of a program where they invited a psychologist to analyze artists' work, you know, in front of an audience. And uh, the, the psychologist said that, you know, I was a childless woman and I was making um, babies. Um, they're sort of baby proportions. Um, I would, that is interesting, and I, I, I don't think it's true. I think, to me, they're dolls. They're not people. I don't, uh, and I do think of them like dolls in, in that I play with them and I reuse them and I put them in different clothes and I put them in a different pose and a different piece. And um, I remember when I loved dolls as a kid, passionately, and I had those little kittles. They had enormous heads. And my mother told me one day that I would grow out of dolls. And I was like, oh, no. And she said, oh, honey, it's OK. You're not going to miss them. And anyway, if she were alive today, I would be like, I win. I am still playing with dolls. <laughs> so good try, Mom. Yeah, there was a question down here. I have thought about that so much because I, my grandmother taught me how to oil paint when I was like nine. And I, I had taken all these classes and I went to art school to oil paint and I you know, registered that as my major and I you know, pursued it and then I took this stained glass class and I was like, oh my God, I'm changing my major, I'm never doing anything else. And that, that was kind of abrupt and shocking to everybody, including me. 
Um, it doesn't smell. Um, it's so inorganic. First of all, it's there's a, I don't really know, but I, I have a couple of theories. One, it's very beautiful. Like, I think clay looks like feces. And <laughs> I don't want to be touching that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it also dries out my skin, and I don't like that either. Um, and uh, oil paint was, just, like, disgusting to me also. So maybe I have some sort of weird, like, germ phobia thing going. Uh, stained glass is filthy, but it just doesn't look like it is. Um, it's, uh, I think, a, a very technical craft is something that, it, uh, also a craft like stained glass involves many different things. So I'm, I'm cutting the glass and shaping it, and then I'm sandblasting it, and then I'm using this kind of engraving tool, and then I'm using a whole different kind of engraving tool, and then I'm painting and then I'm assembling it and soldering it together. That's a ton of different processes. And I, like, I didn't like oil painting because it was just like you stood there and had to be creative. And it was like the most nightmarish experience of my life. It was like, <laughs> nothing's happening. <laughs> There's something wrong with me. <laughs> so um, I liked the mediumness of the medium. It was like in between me and the creativity. And also, it synced me up uh, in a way that I felt like I'd never been synced up before. So that's some of my theories. All right, any more? A bad day in the studio? I have a lot of bad days in the studio. What does it look like? Are you, is it well, it looks like me going and lying down on the bed. Um, <laughs> because uh, I work out of my home. And uh, uh, that's really necessary for the ADHD thing. So I like walk in and out of the studio like a hundred times a day. And I, I just end up like not working and feeling really guilty and terrible. But I've been doing this for 40 years. I probably, like, I don't even know how many hours per week I work. Um, it adds up, I will say that. And also, some things are really important, like doodling, that I don't consider working for some reason because they are effortless and pleasurable. And I am half Protestant. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the other half is Jewish, doesn't help. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much.